All right, so I believe we, we can start. So we have still people coming in the room, and I think that that's okay. Um, so <clears throat> thank you, everyone, uh, for, for joining the call. Uh, so this is to uh, launch officially the, the risk data race standard. Um, and so I'm very pleased uh, to have all of you to um, to, to, to do it. Um, so we have um, quite a packed agenda for this uh, one hour of uh, uh, webinar. And so we'll, uh, we'll start right away. And I will ask uh, my colleague Zoe uh, to, to give the opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you all today. Good morning, good evening, wherever you may be. Uh, my name is Zoe Trohanis, so I'm a lead disaster risk management specialist at the Global Facility for Disaster Reduction and Recovery here at the World Bank. And I'm really excited to welcome you all to this webinar for the launch of the Risk Data Library Standard. Um, so as you may know, the concept um, uh, for the risk data library started, you know, with a consultation led by our team here at GFDRR, as well as with the United Kingdom's Department for International Development at DFID. And there was an initial version of the risk data library that was developed with contributions from many organizations, including the Global Earthquake Model Foundation, UCL Epicenter, and the British Geological Survey. And since 2022, Swiss Re Foundation has also been supporting uh, the development and promotion of this library as an open data standard um, and has provided some grant funding for that. And so today we're really happy to be here to announce the release of the Risk Data Library Standard, which is an open data standard uh, that makes it easier to publish, access, share, and use quality disaster and climate risk data. And so you may wonder why at the World Bank do we care? Why are we supporting an open data standard for disaster risk information? And I think it's, sadly, it's no secret uh, that natural disasters are causing increasing damage and losses. So in 2022 alone, there are about $275 billion in economic losses. And that's only a tiny fraction, really, in terms of the impacts on the poorest that aren't even captured in those data. So beyond financial losses, damage, disaster risk assessments also need to incorporate socioeconomic and non-economic data to better assist the most vulnerable. Um, so really, I think what we're trying to do with the data risk library is consolidate all these different types of data sets to make it easier to access and even have a more um, uniform approach for storing, sharing, and discovering this information. So it's gaining traction. So we already have um, 100 data sets available on our catalog. And so World Bank staff are using these, and also there are some external groups, including the uh, IFRC, International Federation of Red Cross. And so for now, um, just to mention that this Library standard is being overseen by a steering committee of disastrous management experts. Um, and moving forward, it will be continued to be maintained by our digital earth team at uh, GFDRR, of which Pierre is a part. And so today you're going to hear from various team members, and we hope that you will also now join, join the force and uh, be early adopters and contribute as well to this new um, common language of risk data. So with that, Pierre, back over to you uh, to moderate. I know we do have a packed agenda, so hopefully that was concise in terms of opening. Thanks a lot, Zoe. Um, so yes, we indeed have a, a packed agenda. And so I will now hand over to uh, uh, Thomas Phillips, uh, who is head of uh, GEO at Swiss Re. Uh, so, as you know, Swiss Re Foundation has been a, a really a very important partner uh, in that project, and I would say it's not every day um, a sponsor is, uh, you know, uh, putting money on a, um, a digital public good such, such as an open data standard. So, um, I, I would like really to to thank them, and uh, now I would like to to ask uh, to to Thomas about uh, how Swiss Re is seeing the, the the value of open data standards for, of course, the insurance industries, but also the uh, disaster risk management uh, uh, in countries where it was uh, maybe not possible a few few times uh, back. 
Over to you, Thomas. Thank you and good afternoon or good morning to everyone on the call. And I just would like to say also that I couldn't agree more with what Zoe just said um, before I came in. And um, also, I would really like to thank um, the foundation at Swiss Re that they have pulled me in into these kinds of projects because I think they're really interested. In addition, I also would like to point out that it's sure the, the most vulnerable are um, or the focus of this call today. But in general, I think bringing in standards as what is being suggested here is for me as a data scientist and data engineer at heart, one of the key elements, because we always look very much more, we are way more interested in working with the data, analyzing it, doing the fancy stuff, as we say, but keeping in mind and keeping control of where the data comes from, where it is going, what it is actually describing, all of those things which are within that metadata or in the data standard, which is being put together, I think is, is, is really, really key. So I would really like to thank the whole team for putting something um, together there. However, what I'd also really like to point out, as good as a standard is, it only really grabs or can open up for its full potential if it is actually also really used. And we at Swiss Re see great potential to use a standard like this. I was really, really happy that people have put into it. And there might be changes that have to be done in the future, but we will only see how valuable it is if really a lot of teams join forces and really start to use that because it can become a common language. Um, so thank you to everyone who has put time in, and I'm really interested to see what's going to happen now in this uh, discussion this afternoon. So back to you. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, Thomas. And so let's let's start that, that um, discussion. So I will now ask um, our partner, uh, Rachel Vin from the Open Data Services. So Open Data Services uh, team helped us actually to uh, really think about what is an open data standard and transform our work into uh, an actual standard that we could share with, with others. So Rachel, over to you to explain about the, the process. Great, thanks, Fair. Uh, can you see the slides okay on your side? Yes. Yes, great, okay. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Rachel Bint and I'm one of the directors at Open Data Services Cooperative. So I'm gonna talk very briefly about open data standards and why they are important. So uh, at Open Data Services, we're a workers cooperative and our core business is researching, building, maintaining and promoting open data standards. So they provide meaning to the people who use them. Uh, uh, oh, I'm getting a little bit of feedback here. Just check, okay. Uh, so what is wrong with data anyway? Why do we need data standards in the first place? So we all know here that data can be incredibly messy. I previously worked as a data analyst and most of my time was spent cleaning messy data before it could be used. And data can always also be inconsistent, hidden and unavailable, inoperable with other data. And this is where open data standards can help. But I think it's worth breaking down first what we mean by open data standards. So I'll start with open data. So open data is data that can be freely used, reused and redistributed by anyone. And there's two dimensions of that. One is that data must be legally open, which means it must be in the public domain. And secondly, it must be technically open, which means it must be machine readable and non-proprietary. Data standards, on the other hand, are the rules by which data is described and recorded. So data standards resolve ambiguity and they help systems and people work out how to interpret the data. And I think the easiest way of understanding why that's important is when we look at all the different ways there are to write something like the date around the world. So without choosing and agreeing a standard way of representing the date in data, it's really impossible to know whether the date on the slide is the 10th of November 2012, the 11th of October 2012 or the 12th of November 2010. So we know what data standards are. But in terms of open standards, well, these are standards that are made available to the general public and are developed and maintained by a collaborative and consensus driven process. So open standards are not just available for anyone to read and implement, but the process of creating them is itself open to participation. And that's important. 
So to summarise what open data standards are, they lay out how to format and structure the data, but what makes it open is that the data is available publicly, the decision making is open and transparent, and that it builds on and aligns with other standards. And this final point is really important to avoid uh, what I call the new data standard pitfall. And this is possibly the best cartoon I've seen about open data standards, although I'll admit there aren't many. Uh, and in case you can't see what it says here, it says the problem is uh, there are 14 competing data standards. And people come along and say 14, ridiculous. We need to develop one universal standard that covers everyone's use cases. And then the situation is there are 15 competing data standards. And that is, um, that is what we want to avoid. And it's why the risk data library standard builds upon other standards without duplicating what's already been established within the domain. And so, there are three main components to any open data standard in practice, uh, not including its governance, uh, and that are that is having a schema and code lists, uh, just explaining the structure, having documentation and guidance on how to publish the data, and then having open source tools, so software tools that convert, validate, and help you explore the data. And as I said before, an open data standard means that you can contribute to the ongoing development of the standard. And any standard has an iterative process, you know, where it's improving and over time. And so uh, like the rest of them, the risk data library standard, people can get involved in the public hub repository. And finally, why should you care? Well, Open data standards make everyone's work easier, whether analyzing or producing data. The data is then used, usable and in use. The data can be used to make and measure change. And as a result, the data has real world impact. And that's what we hope from this. That's me, thank you. Oh, we can't hear you. Here, I think you're muted. There, yeah. No, just unmute. Because I'm, I'm, I am on mute, but uh, yeah. Now we can hear you. Okay, perfect. So uh, yes, yeah, thanks again, uh, Rachel. So I, I was just saying that uh, now we'll, we'll go into actually the the core of the risk data risk standard. So uh, what it is exactly, and for that uh, we have Stuart Fraser, my colleague, uh, who has been uh, uh, leading that work for a few few years now. So. Stu, over to you. Okay, thank you, Pierre, and thanks, Rachel, for the introduction to open data standards. Um, it leads very nicely into a bit more of a description about what the risk data library is. Um, I'll do my best to, to give you an overview in five minutes, but we have lots of documentation and um, information online that can uh, provide more information than I can give in this short time. Um, so the risk data library is a suite of open data standards and tools to make it easier to work with um, the disaster and climate risk data. The problems have already been um, noted at the beginning, beginning of this um, event, so I won't go back over those, but we're aiming to uh, improve the access to this type of data through the, the RDL. So we've included four components, hazard, exposure, vulnerability and loss or impact data. Um, within the, the standard, all four components have common information or the generic metadata you would find in any geospatial data layer. So that includes the data set title, description, license, point of contact owner, um, geospatial reference and extent, and also reference to, to the time period that it was, refers to. But we also have specific metadata for each of these components. So within the hazard data schema, um, we describe event sets or individual events that we contain. Uh, these can be observed events, so historical. Um, they can be simulated events. We describe things like the frequency, the, the, the probability of occurrence of those events. We describe the intensity metrics, uh, provide the units explicitly. Um, we can link cascading events, so we can link an earthquake event with a tsunami or with a landslide. And within the data set or within the metadata, we can describe um, the linkage between them, whether one triggers the other or not. 
and we can provide uncertainty so thousands of footprints within um within the event that describe potential realizations of that one event scenario and we can provide current hazard and, and describe very clearly hazard footprints that refer to many different climate change scenarios so within the exposure data we can provide multiple different scales from building footprints to aggregated data as, as Rachel said we use standards where they where they already exist so we we link out to external taxonomies that describe the type of exposure information there whether that's population data buildings infrastructure um, agriculture we we use taxonomies that have already been created by different groups to describe the characteristics of those assets and those people. Within vulnerability data, we can provide fragility and vulnerability curves, impact models, uh, vulnerability indexes, indices for physical vulnerability, for socioeconomic vulnerability. And we describe these using the same hazard types, exposure information that we use in the hazard and exposure components. So they're all tightly coupled and we can provide searches across each of um each of those components of the standard to help people access the relevant data where where um in an easily searchable fashion and the final component is the loss um data so we can include their impact information on uh, in terms of monetary metrics non-monetary again for for all of the different types of exposure data and the hazards that are included in the other components we provide ex explicit description of the metrics, whether that's a scenario loss or annual expected damage. Um, we provide return period losses um, and the metadata is very clear on what's contained within the data set. Importantly, we can link the loss data to the other components so that when you view some loss information within the metadata, you can see which data sets contributed to those um, those losses and you can see how those losses have been estimated um, in terms of the approach that's been taken as i said at the beginning there's there's various different resources so on the top left we have the main web web page uh, we have the github open development code and templates that we use um, and are, are useful for implementation we have the documentation which describes um everything you need to use the metadata and we have the rdl collection on the world bank data catalog which is where we're putting data that um that is recorded with this new metadata standard so the documentation provides things like um, a table structure for each of the components it provides the the uh, attribute and field titles a description of what goes in there the type of information that needs to be recorded it provides example data and metadata. So on the right hand side here is a JSON snippet of some of the metadata. And for each example, we show the tabulated information and also a, a figure as well. We link out to metadata tools, uh, which um, are used in the in the creation of the metadata. And here is an overview of the workflow. So um, with the help of Rachel and the team at ODS, we've created a a spreadsheet template. So you create your metadata in a spreadsheet template following um, a tab structure and along the top all of the instructions that you find in the documentation to guide the process. And that can be uploaded to a converter tool. And that allows you to validate the metadata you've completed, find any errors, and um, correct those within the spreadsheet. And then it converts it into a JSON file on the right hand side here. And that's what you would attach to your data set to um, to share it onto a catalog or share it with colleagues um, with the with the transparent and clear metadata included. And just finally, some examples from the data catalog. Um, here's an example of an exposure data set on the bottom left here. Some resources for residential buildings in Central Asia, for example, and on the right hand side generic metadata like the publisher, the contact point, uh, the version number. We link to the project that this data was created within. 
Um, we provide the, the geospatial extent here in terms of the countries covered by the data set. Um, a link out to some of the technical reports that provide more information about the data sets. And along the bottom, some specific information about the, the type of um, data contained. So in this case, it's buildings. And we're describing the, the value of the structures contained within that data set using this taxonomy from the jed for all project, uh, which was created in the early stages of the risk data library. And on the, on the vulnerability side, you can see some different data here on the bottom. So this data set shows um, flood vulnerability functions based on flood depth for different types of buildings, and it provides damage ratio in terms of percent. So immediately, on looking at this metadata, you can start to see what's contained within the data set. Here. So I'll stop there, Pierre, um, and we can come back to any any useful URLs later if, if needed. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Stuart. And uh, hopefully we'll have some time for uh, Q and A. And if people uh, have questions and at the end, but I, I mean, I think the main information here is that we do have a standard for disaster risk information. Um, that is being adopted by the bank, uh, and so you you are already able to find the data on our um, uh, corporate World Bank data catalog. And so now I, I wanted to ask some early adopters to uh, to discuss about uh, for them what what's the value in the in the risk data based standard. And for that, uh, I would like to ask our first colleague, uh, Fadli Mohamed, uh, who has been working with us as a risk data fellow. Uh, and we worked alongside um, a World Bank uh, project to support them in uh, uh, better integrating disaster risk information in their uh, in their operation. So we'll ask uh, Fadli to uh, uh, briefly explain to us what was his work and uh, how the, the Rizeta library standard could uh, could be of value. Thanks. Yeah. Hello. Okay. Thanks, Pierre. Okay, uh, good morning everyone, uh, good, good evening. Uh, perhaps I will uh, try to explain a little bit about uh, my project that uh, has been done in Indonesia. It's related with the climate change vulnerability profile and local adaptation strategies. So uh, Indonesia have a roadmap towards resilience that including some of the um, more to like uh, National uh, planning for national plan for climate resilience, including the low carbon development in Indonesia, and uh, we also have a more like a climate village program that is more uh, uh, community uh, community level program that is conducted by the Ministry of Environment and uh, Forestry. So uh, we support them to build a climate vulnerability profile dashboard that is uh, built based on the uh, statistic agencies data and uh, as well as the climate projection data that are uh, ha coming from the NASA, both NASA and also from the uh, National Weather uh, or Meteorological Agency. So we have 83,000 village in Indonesia. So what we are uh, doing is we try to build a profile uh, for each village uh, that um, uh, profiling the exposure, the hazard, uh, and, and the vulnerability, uh, uh, combining with the uh, climate projection information. And it's comprised of uh, hazard, exposure, sensitivity, as well as the adaptive capacity, including the temperature and precipitation, hydromet hazard, uh, population, land cover, uh, landscape, livelihood, and like uh, uh, basic infrastructure. So the climate projection uh, information or data that we are gathered it from the uh, our meteorological agency. They already done like downscaled climate projection for five to five kilometers uh, resolution, and then we combine that with the uh, statistic uh, data, and we uh, divide that into uh, uh, six region in Indonesia, and then we do some clustering technique that uh, can profile each of the village of Indonesia in Indonesia. 
So it will show that uh, vulnerability to climate change uh, will vary and uh, significantly across the archipelago and uh, depending on the geographic, economic and also social factors. So uh, this is the example of the uh, one of the clusters that we make, which is a cluster in Sumatra. And it has a characteristic of highland village, and then it's uh, the greatest temperature increase, like uh, and including the precipitation characteristic. Uh, also, the uh, uh, other life, like life, livelihood, uh, and and also the climate uh, and hydromet hazards, including drought, severe weather, or uh, floods and landslides. And we also make some uh, knowledge management, uh, and we. We get we gather a lot of uh, climate adaptation um, journals uh, and articles, uh, and also we collecting the project report because what we are going to do is we want to match making the characteristic of the vulnerability with the climate uh, adaptation action at the local level. So in the future, uh, if this uh, success then we also want to uh, uh, make a roadmap for the resilience big data, uh, which is uh, adding more, more, more uh, uh, high resolution data and also more up to date data for hazard exposure sensitivity uh, as well as the uh, adaptive capacity. So yeah, uh, later on we will uh, provide the uh, based on the um, risk data library standards. So we will make a metadata what the open data that we can support and upload it to the uh, uh, data catalog in the World Bank. And the uh, data is uh, gathered from uh, NASA, the Meteorology, Climatology uh, and Geophysics Agency, as well as the National Statistics Agency, and then uh, the hydromet uh, risk hazard and uh, vulnerability from the National Disaster Management Agency. So yeah, uh, that's all from me. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Fadli. And um, I think what um, I like with that type of example is that, it, I mean, it's a methodology that has been developed for um, for Indonesia. Uh, but here at the bank, uh, something that we like to do is to to adapt things and and maybe replicate. And uh, we believe that uh, thanks to the fact that we now have a data standard, it will be easier to uh, maybe do the same or apply the same and adapt uh, in another uh, context. And uh, so another example I wanted to, to provide uh, today is uh, this time in the, the Caribbean on uh, building exposure mapping. And for that, we also had a, a fellow, Isa, Isabel Tixon, uh, who is from the Philippines, and who is going to uh, uh, explain to you her work uh, with machine learning and how she, that, that work might fit with the, the risk data brain. Isa, over to you. And thanks so much, Pierre. Um, so good morning, everyone. So I'll be briefly uh, discussing our work on uh, generating exposure data layers using AI and Earth observation for housing resilience in the Caribbean. Um, so just a brief uh, background on the Digital Earth for Resilient Caribbean project. Um, essentially, our goal is to enhance local capacity in small island developing states uh, to leverage AI and Earth observation technologies in support of resilient housing and infrastructure operations. And we do this by leveraging um, uh, different Earth observation data sets, including aerial images, LIDAR data, build, um, building footprints, and street level images. And essentially, the idea is to take these raw like um, aerial images, street level um, images, and use uh, machine learning, um, computer vision models, and algorithms to extract meaningful information and, and generate, um, for example, roof classification maps. Um, roof uh, classification maps such as like roof type, um, classifying uh, buildings based on roof type such as flat, gable, hip, or no roof, um, and also classifying them um, based on roof material, so whether the rooftops are made of concrete or cement, um, healthy metal, irregular metal, blue tarpaulin, or whether the rooftops are incomplete. I also want to briefly um, mention that we're also um, exploring the use of street view images to extract um, street level uh, building attributes such as material, security, condition, etc. And essentially, the output of um, the output of this uh, uh, this project are these exposure data layers. Um, 
uh, generated across St. Lucia, Grenada, and Dominica with accuracies of around 87 to 92 percent. Um, and essentially, I've been working with Matthew over the past several weeks in making these exposure data layers available on the RDL for broad accessibility. And our goal essentially is to um, enhance the development and further use of these disaster risk information through these open data initiatives. Um, and making this data available is essential in um, helping governments measure change and producing um, housing needs assessment in a way that is quick and cost efficient. And this is uh, especially critical in post disaster contexts. Um, it's also useful for um, constructing housing vulnerability indices um, based on factors such as uh, social economic status, access to amenities, um, and as well as like structural integrity of the housing unit, which includes exposure data layers that we developed, um, which includes like out, out, um, building outer wall material and roof material as well. Um, another use of these exposure data layers is in developing uh, or producing uh, building asset valuation maps. Um, so building asset valuation is basically quantifying exposure in terms of monetary value. Or, um, and this can be modeled as a function of different building attributes. So, for example, a building made of steel or reinforced concrete might cost twice as much as a, a, um, a house made of brick and wood. And so if you have this information, then you can easily um, create a building asset value map, um, overlay that with um, um, natural hazard maps. So in this particular example, we have um, flood or inundation maps, um, and this can help you sort of quantify the, the monetary cost of um, flood damage per square meter. So just to summarize, uh, the, this, the risk data library is essential for making uh, the exposure data layers that we've generated um, available, comprehensible, and usable for further disaster risk and vulnerability assessment. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Isa. And uh, <clears throat> so again, another example, this time on, on exposure information, which was, of course is critical for us. And where you can see, we can also go to the uh, a quite granular level. Uh, in, in this example, it, uh, we are at the level of the building. Uh, and so that demonstrates also the, the fact that the risk data standard can really, you know, uh, support different types of uh, granularity, which is something I, I think essential for uh, disaster risk, um, uh, different types of, uh, of assessment. Um, okay, so now, um, so of course we we are using the, the standard at the bank, uh, but we also wanted to, to show that uh, uh, people outside the bank are already considering uh, the adoption of the standard. And, and for that, we invited uh, our colleague uh, uh, Stefan Hutsk, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> from uh, GBA uh, Risk Management. Uh, so Stefan has been uh, and is a member actually of the, the steering committee, has been uh, guiding us uh, through that work. So Stefan, over to you and uh, how, what you think uh, standard could be used in your uh, own uh, sector. Thanks. Thank you, Pierre. Um, and hello, everyone. Um, good to have the opportunity to talk with you. Um, yeah, my name is Stephen Hutchings. I'm a system architect at JBA Risk Management, and we're an organization within a, a larger group that specializes in flood data and in catastrophe models and services globally. And we originated serving uh, the more developed insurance and reinsurance market, but we find our data and services highly relevant to international development and to disaster risk too. And um, to pick up on something Thomas said earlier on, these, um, these newer sectors for us highlight this ever-present need for common languages and understanding. And establishing standards like the Risk Data Library standard is akin to to us to sharing that common language um, and that really makes all our lives easier you know it's greater having lots of data sets out there which describe risk but that's only really useful if, if people can find and access them and that includes modelers like ourselves and and if you can understand the key characteristics of those data sets um, you know you need to be able to do that to build confidently on previous work rather than starting again um, you have to start with some answers to some basic questions that the metadata standard 
could help us answer, like what models and data are available, what countries do they cover, uh, what types of hazard do they represent, uh, what units are they expressed in, how do you get hold of the data, all those sorts of things. And, and then once you get more involved, um, what underlying models and assumptions or data sets are, are those derived from too? And, and the metadata standard should help with all of those questions. Um, now, Rachel referred to multiple standards earlier, and, and there is another prominent standard, perhaps slightly confusingly, um, known as open data standards. Um, that's arising from the insurance world. And that's more of a data format standard focusing on, um, on exposure data and on results, um, whereas the risk data library standard is more about metadata and, and it's an enabler, I suppose, for finding and describing available data sets. So I think those, those two uh, should complement each other and indeed we've got overlap on or have had on, on their respective steering committees to, uh, to help make that happen. So I'll just try and give a couple of quick examples of, of use cases where from my point of view as a, as a modeler um, we think the standard here can be particularly valuable. Um, firstly I might wish to develop a new uh, flood catastrophe model for a given country, and that means I need vulnerability data. Um, that may not exist, but with um, with data that are compliant to this metadata standard, I may be able to find, to search and find and understand what vulnerability data does exist out there and what assumptions underpin them. And with that knowledge, I may be able to adapt them with more justification to reflect vulnerability in the country that I'm now interested in modeling. Um, and as a second example, we often want to compare results from different countries or from different models to each other. And to do that with validity, it's, it's important that the results actually mean similar things. For example, uh, I'm picking up on, on the, um, the details that Stuart outlined, um, have, has the loss been derived from models which have used equivalent meaning exposure data, um, that is, do the building or population or infrastructure information described in the exposure, do they mean similar and equivalent things? And that can be hard to determine. The standard should help do that, should help answer those questions too. So that should give us information about where it's valid to make a comparison and where we actually need to treat um, different sets of results independently. Um, and finally, briefly, I'll just mention some test work that we've done with Stuart. I know um, at least one of my other colleagues is online here and he's been directly involved in helping to use the tools sh Stuart showed and to convert data to be compliant with the standard. Uh, we've tested it using uh, flood hazard maps for Vietnam and a flood event set for Tunisia, both data sets that we have made for previous World Bank projects. And, and we've used those tools that Stuart showed us to attribute metadata to our data sets and then to upload, to validate and to convert them to meet the standard. And that helps us publish our project outputs to the risk data library um, and hopefully then see them more widely used and, and reused. And, and, and those are some reasons that it makes sense for us particularly to support this initiative and adopt this standard. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, uh, Something maybe uh, I mean also um, an important value in the in that work is to to try to make the link between different sectors. So your sector, which is the kind of the insurance risk industry, uh, the sector of humanitarian organizations, and also of course development organizations such as the the World Bank. And and for that we were also very um, uh, happy, and uh, we are grateful to our steering committee members. Uh, so I'm going to name the organizations who participated, but we we had um, members from the Global Earthquake Model Foundation, from UCL Epicenter, from the Oasis um, Loss Modeling Framework, for, from IDF, from 3.3, uh, of course, and so uh, from UDBA Risk Management, as well as IFRC. Uh, so thanks to, to all for, for their contribution. And on that, I uh, wanted to, uh, to give the, the floor for a kind of uh, concluding remarks uh, to uh, Nick Moody, so one of the other steering committee members who is the coordinator of the uh, uh, IDF uh, for the um, uh, risk modeling steering group, so the Insurance Development uh, Forum, but also the co-director of the new Global Risk Modeling Alliance, which uh, I understand is also pushing uh, strongly for uh, more openness in, the, in that field. So over to you, Nick. Thanks so much, Pierre. And actually, I'm going to speak 
Um, from the angle of that last program that you mentioned there on the uh, the Global Risk Modeling Alliance, because it's really a, a way of being able to demonstrate the amount of demand there potentially is for this um, really great development. So first of all, thanks for the for this webinar um, and congratulations on the launch. It's really almost impossible to imagine the amount of work that goes into a project like that and I do hope that the, it gets properly recognized certainly from the board's perspective um, it's very much valued um, as I think a couple of presenters have said already it's absolutely critical that this thing should be um, not only usable and useful but actually used uh, and in that context I just wanted to mention this program that we're working on uh, and I say we because uh, Stuart and others in this call are actually already familiar with this program and working on it in some respects um, called the Global Risk Modeling Alliance. The purpose of this is to operate in the international development environment, building capacity in risk understanding in the most climate vulnerable countries, not only climate but also uh, countries facing geohazards as, as well. And so the, the program uh, brings together both private sector modelling principles, but also public sector modelling, um, working side by side with ministries, with departments, with agencies in countries to build their own local autonomous capability in the use of um, risk methodologies, um, evening out what has otherwise been a global imbalance. Uh, in access to these skills and resources and yet this hazard times exposure times vulnerability approach to understanding risk is absolutely critical for making local decisions in unlocking um, risk finance or, or indeed in uh, estimating the value of investment in adaptation um, to, to build resilience. So that's the context uh, of the programme. We were launched back in June last year, and since then we're already operational in countries like Ghana, Costa Rica, Madagascar, Pakistan, Nigeria, a group of other countries. We were operational in, in Niger as well, um, and have learned a great deal. One common feature that comes up in every single workshop is this question, as, and I would say is actually addressed by this risk data library. So when we have workshops in countries and indeed bilateral meetings, we're meeting ministries of finance, public works, environment, um, hydrology. Um, we're meeting uh, key agencies such as the meteorological agencies uh, and others. We're meeting um, <clears throat> a lot of financial institutions. We're meeting private sector. We're meeting insurance supervisors, all sorts. Um, and not least, we're meeting academia and occasionally some humanitarian organisations in countries. And the one common theme that comes up in every single workshop is we need to know what data there is. We need to know what research has been done. We need to know what risk models there are. And very often you find as you bring these organisations together, there is actually a very low level of awareness about what's happening even within each country, about what's available. Uh, we have, I won't name the country, but just two weeks ago we were in a country where um, it turned out just by having one of these workshops that the hydrology uh, agency had no idea what hazard data the meteorology, meteorological agency was holding that could be so useful to them. So that's fine. It's OK to understand that uh, um, OK, so to discover that there is some research available that could be useful to you, whether it's global or local, public or private, but it needs to be described. And it needs to be accessible and the questions, the supplementary questions that come up after these uh, in these conversations are not only what research and data is there, but but what are its characteristics? What is it for? Um, what has it already been used for? Has it been used in validation, for example, uh, elsewhere? Has it been validated? What is the provenance of the data? Um, and every project, uh, I would say that there is in these programs that we're developing with countries, there is every prospect of using this RDL um, standard approach uh, in order to help satisfy that need. 
Um, this is distinct from making every bit and byte of data instantly accessible to the uh, to to potential users. In some respects, that's kind of a, a nirvana that's everybody's mind in everybody's minds um, when perhaps they're non-experts and not quite sure about. Uh, exactly how to go about addressing their risk problems and so the, so so the instant answer is well what we need is the data um it's not so much about actually getting access to all the bits and bytes it's about just understanding what there is and what is going to be relevant to their problem um and so this if you like just this cataloging approach is just an enormously useful first step uh, in bringing together different agencies, uh, departments, ministries, in um, getting, I think, um, Stephen, you might have used and, and others might have used this shared uh, language of risk, which is, uh, I think, so important in getting everybody to collaborate. It promotes transparency, it promotes sharing, it potentially promotes validation, which uh, we are hearing in so many approaches in countries is so important and for all of those things it has huge value it also when i mentioned that word sharing um, and maybe we didn't dwell on this enough earlier on in the presentation it also promotes collaboration across public and private sectors across humanitarians across academia um, and that's um so powerful and i honestly believe we're just at the very very early stages of that uh, being a uh, being a possibility but just through this one little window this global risk uh, modeling alliance but there are so many other windows through which this could happen um we are beginning to see just how this could lay the foundations for a great deal more collaboration than than, than is currently the case um, i'm excited to see also that there is a plan for the sustainability of this approach uh, it's so easy to have done a great deal of work to create a common standard and then to have it put on the shelf. And uh, well, you heard earlier about the 14 stand, the cartoon was great, by the way, the, the 14 standards that have become 15. Um, but to have this sustainably curated and a home for its uh, development in the future, um, I think that is a, you know, that gives a real sense of confidence that for example, in our work in uh, uh, with countries, this is something that we can recommend because we know it has a future and we know it's going to continue to be improved. So, so congratulations on just that aspect of the program. I think finally, I'd just like to say uh, on, on behalf of others on 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 the uh, the board that um, you know we're all grateful to the organisations that have been involved. We're grateful um to the presenters for for presenting their views in in this webinar to everybody who joined the webinar for their interest um and to the swiss re foundation who i just seen come up in chat thank you so much for that comment uh for the funding for having the vision to get behind this uh i think it's been such a collaborative effort right across the uh, uh all the organizations involved um and to use that word collaboration again, it's I think you are through doing this about to unlock a whole world of collaboration. So congratulations on that. Over. Thanks a lot, Nick. I uh, really appreciate your your words. Um, so we we do actually have some some time for Q and A. Uh, so we we'll use that time. Um, I do see some questions already in the chat, but please also raise your hand if you want to speak out. Oh, please write in the chat if you have other questions, technical or non-technical. Um, so the first question in the chat was, uh, so can we come up with modeled flood maps against the floods that came up in the Pakistan during the, uh, the floods of uh, 2022? Um, so that's, that's actually a very good one. Um, so the standard itself uh, do support, does support um, modeled uh, hazard footprints, but also a relevant footprints. And as you mentioned, Nick, uh, that's really important to validate models to to have access to uh, to relevant uh, data. And so I I cannot respond to the specific question of the Pakistan flood uh, flood footprints, but maybe some of my colleagues can. But the the answer from the uh, standards perspective is that yes, we want to, to support that kind of use cases where we have a flood event, uh, we have people who want to access it to uh, maybe do some uh, rapid disaster risk assessment or to test again their own model. 
and those are some things that we want to, to support. But maybe it's two or even my colleague Mattia who want to comment on that. Um, no other comments on that one, Pierre. Um, but I think it would be really good to talk about the potential volumes um, of data that we we'd plan to to describe using the RDLS, which was the the question from Elodie. Because immediately following this webinar, we actually have um, a session in the room there with the Risk Data Library Fellows and anybody else who wants to stay to look at some sample data from, from the archives of GFDRR and others to um, try to code the metadata for those, those data layers. Um, so that would increase immediately the, the volume of data, the 100 or so data sets within the Risk Data Library collection. We would Describe as many data sets as possible um, using the RDLS over the next year. The question is the resources that are available um, within the, the RDLS team to do that. Ultimately, we want to make this a community effort that people like um, colleagues of Stephen at JBA are using this, um, this approach independently so that the World Bank is receiving data already described within this metadata and then we can upload that data to the data collection. Um, similarly with with data being made available through the GRMA and, and other um, other organizations and projects that's the way that will increase the, the volume. So to put a number on the volume at the moment is is impossible. We're going to do what we can to share as much data with this with this improved metadata in the short term. Um, but in parallel, we'll also be promoting this standard in different forums. We'll be um, we'll be demonstrating and, and giving hands on support to organizations who want to use this standard. And that's how we'll uh, we'll achieve a big volume of data that's been shared with this transparent and, and more clear metadata um, in the long term. Um, back to you, Pierre. Yeah, and, and a few uh, additional things on, on that. Um, so, of course, the a standard is only useful when you uh, achieve what we call a network effect, right? It's like a social network. You need many people to use it so that other people are going to be interested. So we believe at the bank we can push for that network effect through uh, different modalities. So one is, for instance, what we discussed last week uh, with the, the colleagues from the GFDR, so the Global Facility for disaster recovery, uh, that we could, for instance, uh, make it uh, mandatory or at least push strongly for all the grantees that receive uh, money through to World Bank projects to make sure that all the risk data is put on the risk data library. So, of course, they will still need some help and uh, like technical help to, to do it, uh, but we believe that uh, that is a good way for us to uh, uh, brute force the, the the upload of a lot of risk information on the data catalog. Uh, regarding the data catalog, we have plans to also uh, develop it to make it uh, uh, easier to search for specific risk metadata on the data catalog of the bank. Uh, but of course, we would like also to see some kind of uh, federation with other data catalogs adopting it. So that would be great to hear from others if they also have uh, some uh, similar plans. Um, so we do see um, the, the bank and our uh, unit as um, one of the, the, the forces that can push toward the adoption. But of course, we we, we need uh, many more uh, partners to, to help us on that. And I think it's, it will be also important to demonstrate that not only the World Bank, it's also uh, out, outside external adopters, uh, maybe governments that will uh, consider the use of the risk data library. All right, so I, I now see a lot of questions coming in. Uh, we still have five minutes. Um, so would it be possible to know more about the vulnerability index created using satellite and street data? How were the data aggregated together and what was the covering rate and the con considerations that lead to this methodology? Um, I believe that's, that one is for you, Isa. Um, so um, maybe, yeah, so just on the, the methodologies that you use, 
uh, to, to create the, the exposure and uh, how you think replicable that is for, for other countries. Great, um, great question. So with regards to the methodology, we used um, a type of machine learning model called a convolutional neural networks, um, which um, is able to interpret um, uh, images. Specifically, we use drone images um, as well as RGB orthophotos. Um, in terms of how replicable, sorry, the question was how replicable it is to other countries. Uh, we actually conducted experiments. Um, uh, uh, we actually conducted experiments um, evaluating the generalizability of the models across the different um, small island developing states. Um, so we do see a performance degradation when um, taking one model, say, trained in Dominica and applying it to another country like. Um, like St. Lucia or Grenada. So um, I do want to emphasize the importance of collecting um, highly localized and contextualized data. Um, with that said, um, it is still possible to, to take these models and apply them with reasonable accuracies ranging from around 82 to um, 87 percent um, based on our um, experiments, if I can, if I remember correctly. Uh, I can share with you our um, paper that we recently um, submitted to a workshop. Um, uh, detailing these uh, the, the results of these experiments more um, in more detail. And not only the paper, but also the notebook, the actual notebook where you can actually uh, replicate and adapt the, the work done and uh, to uh, research. Right. So we have um, developed these uh, two, um, so they're in the form of like Jupyter Colab um, notebooks, which are uh, runnable or executable uh, from your uh, browser. Um, so uh, one is on generating building footprints from drone images. So if you have your own drone images uh, for your own area of interest, then you can easily run the notebook and generate um, building footprints. And then from these building footprints um, and from the drone images, um, we have a second notebook on um, generating um, uh, roof type and roof material classification maps um, uh, with uh, with uh, uh, corresponding with probability scores for each of the predictions. Um, so I can link that maybe in the chat. Um, and yeah, let me know if you have any additional questions. Good, thanks. So and quickly, another one from Juan. Um, so we said thanks. The, the library is a great initiative, but I wonder if you have um, any plans to build capacity in uh, low income countries to use the, the data and so do you have any plan to include tutorials, examples, and how to best use the data? So yes, we do. We actually already do have some uh, documentation and um, like type of tutorials to, to help, but that's still quite technical. So also one of the, for instance, the, the fellowship program that's also been supported by Swiss Swiss Foundation is also for us a way to um, to build capacities closer to uh, to the governments and the NGOs that need those, those information. It's going to stay technical, uh, but uh, we believe there are data scientists everywhere in this world, and uh, not only uh, you know in the U.S. and Europe. So uh, I, I think that's important also to uh, uh, continue to to push for uh, skills transfer and capacity building uh, with regards to uh, to disaster risk information, and that's actually one of the you know the core objectives of the GFGR team. Um, a, a last one on the legal aspects aspects of uh, sharing uh, hazard footprints. Um, so that, that I know is an issue uh, within the bank, uh, but also for, for governments. Um, I believe here we need also to, to uh, provide some best practices and, and guidance and have conversation with what can be shared and what can't be shared. Uh, I, I do see this as a, an extension of, you know, the open data movement and the also the transparency uh, within the, the risk sector. Um, of course, there are liability issues, but uh, that doesn't mean that people should not know about the, the risk for, for their own territory. So uh, I think it's important when information has been developed that some information is uh, made available. Um, and I think on that, we'll close. Um, so um, there are some some further comments in the chat, but we'll uh, so the the meeting has been the webinar has been uh, recorded. So we we'll share with you. Uh, I believe you also had uh, all the information, the resources online. 
for those uh, at the bank today, we'll have uh, we'll continue with the workshop. So if you have any technical questions, you can uh, ask uh, us uh, and come to us. I know many of you are uh, participating uh, online. Uh, but yeah, so th thanks everyone. Thanks to all the speakers, really, to uh, Zoe and, and Nick for, for the opening and concluding remarks. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, be in touch soon to uh, to make that uh, concrete uh, with the library. Thanks again. Bye bye.